Okay. Very loud. Thanks. Uh, and uh, thanks for the uh, invitation. One second. Okay, we'll try and get the time to, to run. So, um, what I wanted to talk about today uh, is pretty personal, uh, yet very like biggish. Um, but what I wanted to talk uh, about is uh, what I've learned about changing things uh, the last 17 or 18 years I've been trying to do it. Uh, not always succeeded, but always trying. So uh, I found five uh, simple observations or insights or lessons learned or whatever you want to call it uh, that could, might be a, an interesting or a productive uh, perspective uh, for you guys. Uh, I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. I live there with my girlfriend and my kids. Uh, I commonly try to, to start things, to design things and bring people together around things and now and then invest in things. Uh, not necessarily with money, but also with time and energy and focus. So I have five things that, that I wanted to, to share with you. The first is, is really about what the kind of the time we're in uh, and how I came to that conclusion. Uh, I started out in 1995, starting some of the earliest web stuff in Scandinavia, like first web consulting company, like a lot of other people in attendance here. Always a good way to start. Uh, the first portal, etc. And I was really this kind of digital guy that, you know, uh, you know, oh, everything is going to be better with the internet, and we just apply the internet to it, and it'll be really interesting. Telemedicine, reading Being Digital by Nicholas Negroponte in 95 made me uh, drop out of high school. Uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not even a university dropout, I'm a, I'm a high school dropout. Um, and, and just kind of continue to that. And I thought it was really exciting, and you know, uh, we were selling all this stuff to big corporations, and I was like 17 or 18 years old, and sitting advising CEOs on what to do, and I was wearing a tie, and I was like trying to be like this business person that I read in books one should be, and all that stuff. Um, but the more and more it got really absurd, and in '99 the whole dot-com thing, etc. But one day I was I was browsing the web, and um, and suddenly I saw this, you know, this manifesto that suddenly was in a totally different language. It spoke to me as an individual. It had uh, big words like people of earth. It, it's, it talked about uh, not being commercial or seats or eyeballs, but about the internet being something differently. Uh, this being the, the clue train manifesto uh, that some, uh, probably some of you are familiar with. If not, it's still pretty wild to read it. It's about 13 years old now, but it's it basically describes a lot of the stuff that's happened the last 13 years. And it really changed my perspective on the, what the net was about. Was the net about making, building a company and making some money within the existing system? Or was it about changing things? Getting back to stuff that worked? Or building a new kind of uh, society and models and way to work? So, um, for me, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the time we, we live in. I think it's a really critical time. Um, and it's a big paradigm, right? You know, the, the changes in the technology we're seeing means that you know, it's so disruptive that's what's going on. So the first uh, insight for you is that I think the, that the perspective really needs to be about reinvention and not about invention or innovation. We are in a period of time where we're fundamentally fundamentally challenging everything. What is a bank? What is democracy? How, do, how does a company work? How does an organization work? And, it doesn't, we, and nothing of this is about adding new layers of complexity to it. It's about blowing it up and f getting back to the core of what it is about. So reinvention, you know, renaissance, uh, old concepts reinvented in a new context. For me, it was like really this like, wow, it's about taking things away and getting back to the essentials. And that's what we're seeing. New systems, new ways of working, getting back to being individuals, being highly empowered, network systems, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, solutions and, and systems. So for me, like, it was a really like, deep thing about reinventing things. Also about you know, making a lot of unhappy friends, because if you're reinventing things or you're really fundamentally challenging things, you're going to meet a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of enemies on the way. 
because if not, then you're not actually working on something that's like fundamentally ch ch changing things, then you're working on something that sounds like a nice little improvement that doesn't really challenge people's per perspective uh, that much. Second thing is about bootstrapping. This is uh, a photo from about February 2009. It's the basement of Podio. Uh, I just put in all the money I had at the time. Uh, I'm always all in. Um, we're sitting here in a basement uh, in a neighborhood in Copenhagen. There's uh, Anas and uh, John, uh, the two original co-founders uh, co of Podio, and Ulrich, who also put in a bit of money and helped. And what we basically have at this point is nothing. Uh, we, we burned through the money I put in in about four or five months. Um, we had done a lot of experiments and we'd done a lot of work. But if you look at it, really, we're sitting in a basement with some old Mac computers, uh, and we don't really have a lot. But what we had was the perspective of using what we have. The old model was building a big dreamish plan of what it would take to get things to happen. For me, uh, the big lesson is always that the, that the common kind of thing about people that actually make things happen is that they're bootstrapping. Not necessarily only kind of the financial bootstrapping uh, in, the, in that sense of the word, but really about the bootstrapping, about using what you got to get to the next level. And then when you reach that level, you use what you have at that point to get to the next level again. And that's basically how we build Podio, and it's how I always try and apply things. Even when we were really successful and had some money, we bootstrapped to do something that seemed like we were even bigger. We opened a pop-up store in San Francisco. And yeah, it cost a lot of money, and at that point we had raised a lot of money so we could do it, but we were competing against industry giants with billion dollars of marketing budgets. So with $100,000, we did something that had a tremendous impact. It's always about bootstrapping and using what you've got. It's also some, some times now and then a bit, bit scary when you realize how little you got. Basically, you know, we're sitting in a basement, we have vision and ambition, we have some technology, and that's all we got. And then we started working from there. Third thing is really about tools. And this is like, you know, from like some kind of agency, like, you know, the big logo thing. Um, this is from uh, one of the companies I'm involved in, the 23, that builds tools for visual sharing. Um, so what they're doing is basically building a tool to allow uh, everyone to build a video-centric website. And, and for me, like, tools are so interesting and so misunderstood. The beauty here is that, okay, suddenly you're building a tool that means any organization in the world can build something like TED.com in a day or two. You're not really that clever. You're just building a tool to build a website. It sounds even somewhat boring uh, nowadays. But what you're building and providing is the tool to do something. You're not providing a full solution or a concept. You're just providing a tool. And, you know, 23 is currently powering 300 plus of those video sites. We probably will end up powering thousands of those video sites globally, right? Uh, a scale of things that, that you, you can't have in any other way. So, for me, tools are really interesting, and I think I get the sense that a lot of you guys here are tool makers, right? Tools are, you know, fundamentally technology and, and fundamentally about who we are as human individuals. Uh, everything in this room is tools, you know. We just don't think of it, right? You have a tool to sit, you have a tool. I have all kinds of tools on me, like physically at this point. Um, so, what we often forget is that we, we just think we're tech guys or tech girls that do some technology stuff. But what we, what we really are, we are tool makers. And tool makers have a tremendous important role in society because we create the tools. And as McLuhan once said, uh, then the tools create us. Every little design detail in what you do have a tremendous impact on the world that we live in. With Podio, some of our core kind of values that we were putting in, and values sounds, ooh, we're tech guys, we don't talk about values. But our values were empowerment of the individual. That forever it should be about the individual building the tools to work, building the apps the way they wanted to work, and not how other people afford it. And it was about transparency and openness within organizations in, in terms of giving that kind of uh, new dimension to working. That's what we're putting into the product. 
It's what makes it, you know, there's value in values. Um, and as toolmakers, we often forget that and we just think about it's a technical solution to a problem. No, you're toolmakers. You create big parts of reality in the world by the way and the value you should put into your tools and the designs you do. Simple, but very misunderstood commonly. Third thing is, is really about doing stuff that, that uh, becomes bigger than you know, yourself. Um, there's always great opportunities to stand on a stage and shine, uh, but for me, for some reason, and I'm not really sure, it's always been int interesting in facilitating things. When I was a teenager, uh, I was an ice hockey DJ. An ice hockey DJ is, is, uh, is a guy or girl that sits and plays the music when there's a break in the ice hockey game, and there are a lot of breaks in ice hockey games. So you can do two things. You can be really smart and play some funky music, which you know, makes you look smarter and, ooh, I'm the DJ and I'm cool. Or you could work with the crowd, playing weird stuff, or just enough to get them to create the, 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 create the vibe of the event and start clapping and going crazy or chanting or whatever they want to do, right? And I don't know, I was sitting there, I was probably 12 or 13 years old, like 3,000 people as, uh, as spectators, right? Press a little button, just the right timing, five seconds later, like you have 3,000 people going crazy. And, and people coming back from that won't say, ah, there was this amazing DJ and he was like really cool and hip. They won't even really notice, right? So it's really about what you can do to facilitate larger things happening. What is it that happens when you really take your ego out of it and create something bigger? With Podio, a big part of the lesson is there are so many people involved that just made it happen, you know, because we did something that was much bigger than any of us, any of us as, as an individual could do. It's a total cliche, but there's so much about startup that is also about the ego and proving yourself and you're young and all that stuff. But it really becomes magic when you, t when you reach the point where you can take it out and really build as a team. Fourth lesson is, is, uh, is about uh, confidence and, and about kind of the personal aspect. This is a photo uh, f about February 2010. At this point, we're still with Podio sitting in the basement. Casper uh, was here, he, he joined a couple of months earlier. And here we're, it's a really bad photo, but you know, it's the only one I got of this kind of historic uh, time. So we're in, the, in, the, in a company called Sing, like, kind of like the LinkedIn for Europe or Germany, uh, like publicly traded big company. And we knew some people there and we were taking a meeting. We showed them Podio for about seven or eight minutes and then we shut down the computer because you know, uh, Germans, copycats, don't, don't want to show them too much, right? And, and we didn't, didn't give them a demo account uh, either. Uh, they're good guys, just, but you know, you need to also stage it like that, it, you don't want to do it, right? So we're sitting in this meeting um, and we're sharing the, our, the demo of our product, our vision, uh, what it is we're trying to do. Uh, we're pretty arrogant about not being interested in selling, but that's obviously a big part of the agenda, all, <laughs> also like in terms of building the relationship. And then suddenly one of the guys, uh, and this is like a, you know, the head of BizTev for a big co corporate company, he says, Okay, so we're this LinkedIn thing. So, so in a Podio world, what is our role? I was like, sorry, what did you just say? In a Podio world, where do we fit in? And we were, Casper and I, we were just like, afterwards, we just, you know, hugged each other and called the other guys like, fucking hell, we're starting to be there, right? We're starting, we can do a demo, we can show, tell our story. We're still five guys in a basement at this stage, right? Uh, in a way where they totally accept that all the stuff we talk about is going to happen, and they just start focusing on what is their little role in it. Um, so, um, you know, what is it that happens when you start having that level of confidence? You know, being an entrepreneur, changing things is really about basically, you know, about having the courage to do it. Um, Slowly, 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 we started actually validating what the vision and the ambition we had, you know, the ambition to become the place where people worked and, and, the, ambition, uh, and the vision to change, to become kind of the future of work uh, with the values we're putting into it. And slowly we just, you know, suddenly everything, you know, you, you just start having that confidence and that kind of uh, uh, self-esteem to actually start doing it, right? So we're still in a basement. Later, you know, it's not a very big creative idea to have a pop-up stall, but it fucking takes a lot of courage. 
uh, to open a pop-up store in San Francisco and do a launch event with 400 people and you know do all that stuff. It sounded it was just like a good idea. We're sitting brainstorming, right? Let's do a pop-up store and. We're about kind of humanizing technology. People should come in for the streets, then we'll help them build apps, and that's cool. And you know, it was a simple idea, but to actually then pull it off. And to this state, we can't really answer why we actually dared to do it. And secondly, how we actually got 400 people to come into the store for the launch. It's kind of, you know, we do know some people in the, in the Bay Area, but not 400. Um, so, so, um, the fifth lesson is really about, you know, what is it the, the personal journey of, of changing things, right? You're putting yourself out there in a very uh, insecure spot. You have so little, yet so much. And it's all about daring and actually building the confidence slowly to, to get it to happen. But, you know, you never get there if you don't put yourself out there. Uh, but it's a real challenge uh, and a personal journey. And people often forget this. Especially because we worked with tools and tech, you know, it's all about the MVP and the market strategy and blah 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 blah. You know, in my work with entrepreneurs, I'm, you know, I've worked with a lot of companies I'm, I've invested in or working with. Uh, you know, it's half of the time I spend on coaching 26, 28, 30 year olds that are doing this for the first time. In two years, they might be going from sitting in a basement to be the CEOs of 40 person companies. It's a huge, huge challenge for you as an individual to actually have the confidence to do it and to grow as a leader and as a person, right? And we often forget this kind of angle to it. Uh, as a joke, I, I now then try to like hire coaches for, for these startups, but it's still like, I, I don't need a coach and uh, all that stuff, you know? But it, it's really a fundamentally a personal journey you're on. Yet again, sounds very simple, but it's really, really hard. So vision and ambition can, you, can, can only uh, take you so far. So what I, what I wanted to end with was basically just a, a pledge to you guys that you know, the, two, the last two days have been amazing and you meet so many like webbed, clued in people like you meet anywhere else on the planet Earth, right? You know, the last 12 months I spent a lot of time in Cairo, uh, in Stockholm, Berlin, Copenhagen, and it's all the si same. They're all like you, webby people, uh, they read the same blogs, they know the same stuff, they're great at product design, communication, uh, they have wild ideas about changing things in, in, in the world. You know, but kind of what only makes the difference is that somebody actually dares to do it. Actually dares to set the vision and the ambition so high. And my pledge and hope for you guys is that, that you do it. Because I see amazing talent, you know, and the magic is when you just start doing it. For, for me personally, uh, one of the kind of things that I think actually worked was throughout the years with the Reboot Festival, we had all these Americans coming in. And they were also just like us, right? They might be doing Twitter and whatever, all kinds of fancy stuff uh, that was pretty significant in changing the world. But they were just like us. Really no drift difference. When we're out drinking beer, you know, there wasn't really any skills or competences or anything. It was all up here, right? They actually were in an ecosystem where people, where it was acceptable to be sitting in a basement saying, I want to change the world. I want to change how people work. I want to change banking. I want to change how people find a job. I want to whatever, right? And that is the difference. The difference is if you can build an ecosystem where it's acceptable to dream and then actually start getting there, then you have you know, a real opportunity at writing a new story uh, about um, your country and, and the time we're in. So that was my two cents. Um, please do something. Thanks.